still playing with me because we met all the good friends of mine. Look at our notes. Look at I have, I have white shoes and white shorts to allow them, you know, and they didn't talk like shorts. Because they're raised like that. They're raised like that. And here they're white, you know, and, and uh, uh, they look like after the Sunday school. They didn't care anyway. And you have, and you have them all down with the daddy's hands, you know, and you have them to take what they're brought up. You know, you want it to, you know, to, to look. And so, but, but, you know, sometimes the angle friends start talking. And they say, hey, uh, they start talking about Mexicans, and they turn to their Mexican friends and say, hey, but, uh, but you're different. Hmm, am I not that different? What's different? What's different? What's different? How do I look different? I don't know if I have a dollar for every time somebody told me, you don't look nice. You see? And what was the Mexican supposed to look like? You know, when I was in the uh, when I was in the second grade, the the, teach, the principal told me, and my, my father was styled as goofball, and so he heard what the principal said. The principal asked if my sister and myself were from the same father because she was styled. She said, mm -hmm. and she styled. Mm -hmm. From the same father? Did they ever hear of a Mexican? You know, and so you people have to be a stereotype. You have to look a certain way, you see. And you have to talk like a certain way to be a Mexican. But you know, there are Mexicans, however, too, and if there's anything but Mexicans, we'll see. There are Mexicans that, that think of themselves as, as, as different. You know, you know I, how many times have I sat there with a Mexican who told me, hey, I have a French friend here. I'm the French guy, well, I don't have a around that much, you see. And remember, many of the French, you know, soldiers when they invaded were Sudanese. I got a French grandmother, it's almost everything. Now, uh, a, a Mexican is now, one of them want to be descendants of, of Indian Jews, they want to be descendants of an awful lot of other people. It's, it's that anything but Mexican, that, that inferiority complex that we get from the what? From the, uh, from the conflict and the colonization. I've already started in another book, and it, it follows the theme of one of my uh, people who I admire the most as an academician, a British historian by the name of B.P. Thompson, who I consider to be a giant, you see. And I take my title from one of his, uh, uh, from, one of, uh, from a quote from him, and it's called, When the Moment Comes. The role of historical memory in the revolt of the Mexican Cotton Papers, 1933. And in this, I want to show, because you know, historians, the Marxist historians included, have always made the mistake of saying, hey, peasants, they don't have a working class consciousness. People, that, and they assumed that all Mexicans were what? Peasants. I was, and I started to research of the San Joaquin Cotton Strike in 1933, and I got two versions. One, that the workers were agitated by the communists, and the other one was that the communists took them to a higher level of, of consciousness. But I started to, to, to research this, and one of the people that was killed on a picket line, a man by the name of Pedro Zubia, 57 years old, and I started to trace back his life from Camacho, Chihuahua, where he was born in 1876 and he left in, in 1891. What was happening there? What was part of his historical memory? Because we as human beings differ from animals in that we do have a memory. And he went to a place called Clifton in Arizona where there was mining there. And he was a miner for 30 years. Anybody who's been a miner for 30 years is what? A wage laborer. Their consciousness has gone up. <laughs> and what the book is going to be is the, the glorification of the working class. Because it's the working class is what we owe everything to. The working class is why you're here in school. And you're not picking uh, uh, fruit. The working class is why I haven't been fired yet, you see. Because the working 
when is there a mixture to sacrifices? And so the book is then about their historical memory to show that human beings know what is fair and what is not fair. But this is the role of positivism. Positivism tells you something that's unfair is fair. Today I look at the newspapers and I saw that we were having a recovery in the California economy and the welfare went down. The next column I read is that we that the Greenspan fund that uh, from the Federal Reserve is saying, hey, we're gonna have to raise the interest rates because this is bad, we're having inflation. And we're saving money because because uh, welfare is going down, people are working, people are getting dignity, but this is bad, this is bad. And the stock market then starts to fall. So the uh, wingspan starts to say these things. That's not rational to me. But it is rational when we look at it in terms of what? Positive and stuff. And it becomes rational. The irrational becomes rational. Unfairness is rational. Exploitation is rational. You see. Making a person a machine is rational. Putting them on that ticket line. So here is then the role of people like myself is to fight to own that. This is why we have a foundation. I knew that the end of affirmative action was coming about back in the 1980s. That's why when an opportunity came to sue the University of California system, my student, because that I knew that I have enough charisma that I'm going to pull in young lawyers. Because they'll follow me. Because they believe my idea. You see. And so these young lawyers now know the law. And so we're going to be fighting. The works have a political purpose is to get people consciousness point. Read Richard Delgado's book, No Mercy. It's a must book for you. Also read Richard Delgado's the Rodrigo Chronicles. Because you start to read what the critical race theorists are saying in the law. And there's something that, that, that I'm also saying that they can't shut it out of the schools. Because if they shut it out of the schools, then you look at fairness, those schools could burn. Because that is irrational to condemn people to the ovens of ignorance. Thank you very much. Look, right now, and let's be very honest, there are problems with rising education, and I admit it. But there are also an awful lot of problems with, with American education. American education has historically failed minority group members. And for them to, to uh, single out bilingual education is hypocrisy. It's, it's hypocrisy. There are good bilingual pro uh, uh, programs, there are bad bilingual programs, there are bad bilingual programs because of certain reasons. One of the reasons is that the universities are not doing their job. And the universities, we have up here the Barbara School of Languages in California that can teach you a language in eight weeks. My God, I mean, we can have, we can have this type of program and, and train teachers during the summer at most of our universities and give them full credit. In our school, the foreign language department doesn't have one Mexican in it. I'm trying to get something there, and I've been trying to get it for the last 20 years from me. I want to make it a requirement for every uh, Mexican and Central American student to take Latin. To me, it seems reasonable, because you go back to the roots. I many times I ask them, what is the word? And they don't know what the word is. They say, pronounce it in Spanish. And they pronounce the word, the English word in Spanish, and they say, hey, yeah, it's this. Pugilist, pugilista. That's what they say in Spanish. But do you get any cooperation? No. Is it? They don't get any cooperation because they don't want to change, because schools, you know, your curriculum 
has to revolve around factors that only want to be there Tuesdays and Thursdays. Or on Monday, Wednesdays, and Friday, they want Tuesdays and Thursdays off. And they don't want to be bothered at any time other than in, on their uh, faculty hours. Come on, I mean, if this is the way it is, we look today by new education. Could be something that would be good, because you know, there's a, there's a saying, if you know three languages, you're trilingual, if you know two languages, you're bilingual, if you know one language, you're American. <laughs> <laughs> When I was a kid, I used to have a program called A Page of the Ignorant. You see, and they used to come out on the radio, A Page to be Ignorant, to be dumb, to be stupid, to be Ignorant. And then, you know, they would say certain things they did. Uh, and then, you know, A ah, Page to be Ignorant. Uh, you know, all over the country, if you know more than one language, you know, you're an intelligent person. It's something that is prized. Here, you're being moved. <laughs> You're being rude. I mean, why are you being rude? You know? Because they, they don't know, because they don't, you know, when I, I was in Germany for, uh, for 19 months as a soldier, I, I learned it because I wanted to know what was jokes. You know? Or I wanted to date, you know? But the thing is, you know, the thing is, that people, I think, don't know the language. Can you elaborate more on the fallout of the 187 and affirmative action, how it's affected the university system as far as student population and stuff like that? Well, it's, it's affecting more, let's say, the University of California system. Uh, this year, I don't think that Berkeley is going to have a uh, black uh, law student who's going to be attending. And I think that they're only going to have about five uh, Mexican students. What is the important thing is that it gives it legitimacy. 187 gives it legitimacy because what is it saying? People say this is the law of the land. This is the law. We're a nation of law, laws. We're not a, 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 a nation of parents. This is what they say. 187 is legitimized this type of thing. What is it doing with the Mexican community? August, before the November election, 60% of Mexican Americans were for 187. By the time November came around, 70, 80% of us voted against it. Because people recognized it as being what? As being racist. Today in California, people are voting color. You see? We're a divided state. And even the Republicans today, even Linda Chavez, you see, has come out that uh, the Republicans have lost the Mexican community. And, you know, we're going to have to drive that message back, you see. And I think that, you know, the Republicans don't like it. They say that people like myself are being intellectually dishonest by saying that they're more than the racist. We are racist. A racist is a racist. And so you say it. They don't like it, they know it. I had this guy, Red Spencer, you know, from Voices of Citizens Together. He had a, a letter writing campaign. He had over a hundred uh, letters going to my president uh, that, that they want to the, the fire me. Stupid, I have tenure. You know? <laughs> what do they want to make me, a rich man? You know? So they fired me, I mean, I, uh, you know, the notoriety I got, I could get, uh, you know, I could go on free speech. But the thing is, these people are pushing the issue. And I don't like that. Because you know what? One time I was reading the New York Times, and I read that a man by the name of Terry McWilliams, who I respect and worked an awful lot, was going up in an elevator and he got mugged by some, uh, some black youth. I'm sure if the black youth would have known who he was, they would have touched him. But they did because of the color of his skin. I don't want to go into a society where I judge people by the color of their skin. You see? And I think that people are doing it today. 
And people say, well, there are some Chicanos and some blacks that are supporting me. Yeah, but there are a bunch of opportunists. I know the Chicanos who are supporting, and they're the opportunists. And I know many of the blacks who are doing the opportunists. They're making a buck in this capitalist country, in society. You know, I, I, I really do hate introductions on, all the time. So I'd like to say that, you know, I, and I, some of you are going to hear some repetition from today's presentation, from yesterday's presentation. But, you know, I remember when I got my doctorate, I felt very important because I had a doctorate in front of the name. And so I went home and I, and I told my father, and my, you know, that I had a doctorate. And my father says, si eres doctor, que cura? <laughs> and, you know, I've always thought about that because I really think about things and think about words and I tease an awful lot, but I really do think about the words. The things that I do many times seem a little bit idiosyncratic, but they have a purpose. Like, you know, I, I wear the gafas all the time. And they say, well, well, where's the sun? Well, in a way, I wear it to bug people. Uh, you know, uh, if you've ever been with Anglo-Americans, they always want to look at you in the eyes. They want to look at you straight in the eyes. You know, if you don't look at straight in the eyes, you know, something's wrong. So I like to sit there with my glasses, and I learned a long time ago going to meetings that used to bug people. Now, now I find it a bugging Chicanos. And what it's telling me is that Chicanos, that Chicanos were becoming a little bit like them, because we're letting something like that bug us, you see, and we should allow them to bug us. And then some of the, the things come back and I was on uh, the radio program today, and, and I'm sorry, you know, I, my, my parents come from or my mother's family comes from Sonora, and I was raised with a family from Sonora, and everybody uses bad words. It becomes almost natural to use bad words. You know, uh, the other day, the, in Santa Barbara, they, they renamed a street, and they were going to name it Cesar Chavez Way. And I said, Jim, well, you can't name it Cesar Chavez Way. You can have, you know, Caesar uh, is Cesar Chavez, something like that, but not Cesar Chavez Way, because you know how our people are, you know. Well, today, I use the word pendejo in, in, in uh, the radio station. Somebody called up very angry. But, you know, I use it not in, in the term. In my new book, uh, Anything But Mexican, I use the word uh, uh, there, the pendejo factor. And I say that, you know, that many times we act pendejos or nos, nos hacemos pendejos because we don't want to act. We don't want to do something. And sometimes we don't want to do something because if we know the truth, then we have to do something about it. It's, it's like, uh, did you ever see the movie con, uh, Cantinflas? Estabas, you know, he was up there in el cielo and he was telling the, uh, the uh, joke of, the, of uh, el pícaro to, to the, uh, to the uh, angels up there and saying, Peter comes there and he kicks him out of heaven, you know. And so he goes down there, and the first person he sees, el diablo por sus cuernos, he says, tú también eres casado. You know, and, and you know, the thing is that many times society puts cuernos on us, and we do nothing about it. And it's not using it, because, you know, if we know that something is wrong, then we have to do something about it. This is why in the last... Um, Six years, the last six years I almost died because I took on the University of California system and they spent between four and a half million dollars to five million dollars fighting me. And, uh, you know, they built an awful lot of myths and it was something that was a grind almost every day and I am now just starting to recuperate. Uh, I get tired because of it because it was a constant, you know, uh, a hassle there. But I wanted to prove one thing. Number one, that we can win. Because if a person like me that has white hair can win, you can win. You see? And we can't, we, we can't take what society does to us because society is not just. And this is not the most just country in the world. And people can't tell me, go back where you came from. Because my people were in uh, Arizona in 1729, they were, you know, there from Sonora. So where am I going to go back? 
one of the reporters today asked me, well, if, he says, if you don't like this country, why don't you go back to, uh, you know, where you came from? I didn't come from Mexico. I came from here. But, you know, you look at my book, too. When I call it Occupied America, I'm not talking about just Mexico, because Mexico is a social construct of, uh, of uh, colonialism. I'm talking about Central America. I'm talking about all of the Americas, you see. And we're going to have to start to look at that thing of racism and what really makes up racism. And we start to see that, you know, there's, there are different kinds of racism. There's a racism uh, towards black Americans, which is a racism which is insidious, and we should hate that kind of racism. But, you know, it's still, there's a certain, because of the historical nature of it, there's a certain guilt today in our society. They did something wrong. They did something wrong when they killed off the Native Americans. Never putting it together because you have an invisible border and you say, here, you know, see, indigenous people over that you know, border, we had nothing to do with it. And the people are really coming across, those are the people that are the problem because they don't even belong here. And you go to Texas, for example, and, you, and the whole thing of history, that they fought a war against Mexico and they beat Mexico in a, what they call a just war. And what they say, you know, I remember in Texas, you know, when I first got to Texas, I found it fascinating because uh, people in their own minds, many people were, uh, were intimidated. I remember one time when I was in, in a place called Tohoka, Texas, and I just sat there in amazement that, that the Chicanos allowed themselves to be called boy or junior, and they wouldn't say anything about it. But this is, you know, from my perspective, but I had the perspective, another perspective, another experience, which was the California experience, you see. As bad as things were, the people didn't openly tell you those things. But you know, today, students, and you know, one of the callers today, that they didn't experience racism. This is what they were saying. Well, racism today is a racism that we really can't understand, you see. And you're going to have to, to, to understand that racism of today, which is not the racism at one time where they would call you a greaser or where uh, they would t tell you you couldn't buy in a certain place or you couldn't go to a swimming pool. This was obvious. You could, do, you could work with that kind of racism. I remember the first time I went to Lubbock, I went to a reception, and here I was with a guy by the name of Mark Smith. He's a good lawyer. But one of his guests tells me, he says, you know, did you ever hear about the machine? I said, what machine? Hitler's machine. You know, I said, oh, God, here it comes. And, it, and then he started telling me about a machine that, he, that Himmler took to Hitler, and they brought in 10 Jews, and shh, it eliminated the 10 Jews, and then they brought another 10 Jews, shh, about the 10th time that they used the machine. He says, they brought in a Mexican. And shh. And, and Hitler says, why, why are Jews Mexican? You had Hitler talking with, with a Texas accent, you know. And I, he, said, uh, uh, he said, well, we had to grease the machine, didn't we? I sat there and I said, wow. I looked at the guy and I said, should I hit the guy? I know I can't hit the guy. The guy's too big, you know. Uh, and then I'm going to end up in jail, you know, for, for hitting him. Then I told him, I said, well, you know, they have a saying in Latin America. You pour hot water over a white Anglo-Saxon uh, Texan and you get instant caca. You see? <laughs> And I put that in the first edition of Occupied America, you see. And the thing is, the guy wanted to hit me, you see, because I had insulted him. But, you know, that racism, you know, and I've never been racist against any group. You see, uh, uh, I always remember the story that Bert Corona, who was an activist in California and almost all over the United States, used to tell about Ed Cabello. Ed Cabello used to be a, an activist. And he was a bombastic person. He was telling about the war, the Mexican-American War, and he was telling about uh, Carney's Army of the West coming into Santa Fe and the atrocities they, they committed. And they were a little bato loco, a little bato loco, I don't know if you have them up here, little street dudes, you know, a uh, little cholillo, you know, he's back there, and he's listening. And he didn't know if, 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 if he was listening, because he was giving that, you know, Ike look. You know, and you know, and uh, you, you couldn't penetrate this. But after the speech, he got up. He went out into the street, and the first bolillo he saw 
I don't know if they still use the word bonillo, or it is a what? It's a piece of bread. But we used to use it to refer to what? It's a gringo. And the first bonillo he saw, he let him have it. Bam! And the guy fell to the ground. He says, what was that for? And he says, that was for 1847. He says, he says, yeah, but that happened over 100 years ago. He says, yeah, but I just found out about it right now. <laughs> you see, it, 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 and nobody's talking about history, you know, to get even or anything. But you have to know about history. But I know I said no what? Pendejo. Because if we, you know, if we allow then that lie, the myth, to become what? The reality, then everything is all right. But what is the present? Because, you know, I come from Los Angeles, and Los Angeles is a place that is very polarized today. It, the, the racism is never as hard as, uh, you, you know, as 30 years ago. California was, was actually one of the best places to live 30 years ago for a Mexican because there was some mobility. There was uh, a, a certain amount of integration that was taking place that wasn't taking place in, let's say, places like Texas. I go back to Texas today, and I don't see the, the hardening attitudes that I, that I feel in California. And why? It's a matter of numbers. You see, in California today, 30%, one out of three, almost one out of three of the residents in California are Latinos. That is an awful lot, one out of three. You see, in the Los Angeles City Schools, two out of three students are Latinos there. That's two out of three, and that's a big percentage, and it's growing, because we're having babies. Did anybody ever see that, uh, that picture, uh, Cousin Vinny, where she says, you know, you can hear the, uh, the biological clock, you know, uh, the median age of what? White woman is 35. The median age of Latinas is 24. And so you see that, that you know, that right now they can close the border, but, the, but those babies are going to keep rolling out, you see, because they're going to, they're having an awful lot of children. Well, this is changing things. This is changing the whole philosophy of society, because all of our immigration policy up until 1965 was based on national origin. The 1921 Act and the 1924 Quota Act that were passed in immigration were passed under national origins. And what actual national origins meant is that it had a fixed percentage to keep the percentage of Northern Europeans higher than the percentage of uh, of Southern Europeans, because they didn't want as many Italians as many uh, Greeks coming in as they did uh, Nordic people. When we see these revisions and we see uh, uh, the acts revised, this is always at the forefront. Keep national origins. Let's make sure that we have more Nordic people than we have Alpine people or we have Mediterranean people. We don't want too many people with very dark hair. We don't want too many brown-eyed people. We want a certain amount of blue-eyed people because those blue-eyed people are more intelligent. This has been a basic immigration policy of the United States. That policy in 1965 was reversed. Because under the 1960s, we had another ambiance that was more, uh, it was uh, a more liberal one. It put Latin Americans on a quota, but it was a very liberal quota because it was based on family preferences, you see. And people believed that people from Europe were going to continue to come in, although Europe was now recovering and you were making more money in Europe than you were making here in the United States. So European immigration did slow down. If you're a worker in Germany, you're much better off than if you're a worker in the United States. You have much more social benefits. All right. But what happened, they started to come in, not only from Mexico, but they started to come in from the Far East. You see, they started to come in from uh, India. They started to come in from the Middle East. These are people that look different. By the 1970s, people are starting to panic. We're going to have a nation now, and you see Los Angeles go from 10% Latino in 1960 to about 25% in 1970. This is starting to scare the hell out of people, you see. At the same time, the city is getting an awful lot more what? It's getting an awful lot more 
population. You don't have as much housing, etc. You uh, people uh, are starting to rebel in paying taxes. You have a certain amount of de deterioration happening, and you start to blame. You find a scapegoat. Who's the scapegoat going to be? The immigrants. And they start a campaign. And that campaign uh, is one of constructing an image of the immigrant. That of what? What I've t uh, told the classes today, that of the illegal alien. And you, that is, you, when you start to look at it, illegal alien. First of all, it tells you that Mexicans look like E.T., you see. That uh, Mexicans are going to look like E.T., you, they're going to uh, be like the body snatchers. They're going to come over and take over your body. And you see an awful lot of movies, uh, Independence Day, for example. These are the aliens, and there's a certain fear of the unknown, of the other. The other one is illegal, which is criminal. A person is a criminal if they cross a border trying to eat. And they construct this. The reality of the picture is, and as I've said uh, before, is you can go to California, you don't find Latinos begging. You find other people begging, and I'm not criticizing them because conditions are making them beg, but you don't find Latinos begging. You find people with a sign on a corner, and you find a Latino right next to him sell selling cacahuates and selling oranges. You see, they don't. But we're coming here for welfare, you see. And that's the image that people have. You look at all of the figures. We have more labor, uh, labor participation than Anglo-Americans. We're 81% that are active in the labor force. They're 79%. The problem is we're not getting paid enough. We don't have, uh, we don't have medical insurance, for example. But this construction, this racist construction that paints a picture of a, of a whole people and generalizes that, you see in, uh, it's starting to be constructed in the 1970s. You even see it on television where the word racism becomes an innocuous thing. And along with that, you have your think tanks. The right wing starts to uh, mobilize, and you have then people like uh, Richard Mellon Scape. M Richard Mellon Scape, in the last 30 years, has given 200, two, excuse me, $233 million to right wing uh, causes. They've taken over the university. You have the Owen Foundation, the Pioneer Foundation, the Heritage Foundation, the Smith Richardson Foundation, and all of these decrepit uh, old uh, white people who are going to die want to keep their concept of America, and they uh, and they donate these billions of dollars to right-wing causes, and you then they start to to construct this racist uh, agenda, this racist agenda that is uh, that produces the bell curve the book, The Bell Curve. And this person here, the two people were on subsidies, you see. The, that whole fracas over politically correct. You have them finance the English only. You have them financing 187, 209. And right now, the attack on California against bilingual education. Now these things are not things that are happening by accident. We're in a war. And Pat Buchanan is right. There, it is a cultural war that's going on. But like, excuse me, but like pendejos, we, 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 we wander around and we're not organizing. We're not doing anything about it. In the last five years, I've also realized that maybe I shouldn't be as active as I have been in certain other sectors, and I should start to focus. I've been doing an awful lot more writing for example. And one of uh, the books uh, that I just put out it was Anything But Mexican. You look at the title, Anything But Mexican, people will say, gee, that's a bad title. But it isn't Anything But Mexican. You go to Los Angeles and when you see Mexican food over there, uh, at a, the oldest restaurant in L.A. is in Chorno. Make great green tamales. You know, con rajas ahí, con uh, con uh, queso, I mean, really good. Al estilo sonorense. Couldn't be anything but good. But the thing is that you have over there and you have a sign, Spanish food. 
because it makes it more palatable because it's Spanish, you see. And, and you see, just the attitude that people have, the tensions that we have in the city, and you have not, nobody talking about what? Latino issues. It's almost like we didn't exist. And even when you go on Spanish language television and you see the Barbie dolls up there, you see, they don't, they don't look like the populace. But this is a form of racism, it's a very insidious type of racism. Uh, I wish I had a dollar for every time that they told me, you don't look Mexican, you see, you see. And I, you know, I, again, being very uh, irreverent, I tell them, you haven't seen my nalgas, you know, and you know, you, you, the thing is that, you, you know, uh, but the thing is that sometimes you have to get irreverent with people. And, but you know, when they say you don't look like Mexican, it's like, you, what? It's a compliment. It's like a, it's a compliment. Or Mexicans themselves that tell you what? I had a French grandmother. Les faltan las plumas, but they have a French grandmother. And that's anything but Mexican. Is, uh, it's a play on words, but it, it is a strategy because I want to control history. Because I know that future historians are going to be writing about what happened today, and they're going to be basing it on works that are happening today. And my reality is Los Angeles, and I think that Los Angeles is like that Blade Runner movie. It is a what? It is a view, it's a window into the what? Into the future for you. And so you look at that. Now I'm coming out with another book. It's going to be, it's already completed. It's going to be published in, uh, in January by University of Notre Dame Press. It's called Sometimes There's No Other Side. It's an essays on truth and objectivity. And I show how the neoliberal philosophy controls academia and controls the courts. You see, this is a nation of laws, and just because a bunch of pendejos go out and pass a 187, they expect us to what? To follow the law, because it's, you know, that's the will of the majority. They don't talk about fairness, they don't talk about justice, they don't talk about the future, but they talk about what? This is a, that we're supposed to follow the law. This uh, book, uh, this uh, book also talks about my case against the University of, uh, of California. But I hit the system, and I hit the system, and I hit also Chicanos, because I'm getting tired of Chicano academics who's saying that the 60s had no value and they were gonna take us to another level of consciousness. Some of them have never been active in a thing. They've gone from K through PhD, and they have no experiential, ex, uh, parental, uh, no experience, you see. And I think that you have to have experience. Experience is good. I uh, look at every time I go to jail, which I've been there now seven times, and I feel very good because I'm learning something, you see. And I'm learning from someone. Put it down on my vita. But the thing is that, you know, that, that uh, we have to look at things like that. You have to lear learn uh, uh, to look at people, to see the differences in people. You have to feel like when you go down the Pilsen district in Chicago and you see how the Mexicans have remade that, that architecture. You have to go, you know, the, one of the greatest experiences for me is when I went to Washington and I marched on Washington because it was the first time I went to a Latino march where Chicanos were in the minority. But I saw, you know, the Dominicans coming in there and they dancing, you know, for, for five miles. They danced all the way, you know. And they, they kept on calling me mommy, you know, and I even got, <laughs> you know, but, but it is a different world. Right now, Los Angeles is an exciting place because, I mean, you know, you have to become a saltero to be there. You know, I went to, to a, salsa, a salsa concert the other day and I saw Winnie Colon, La Tela del Bronx, you see, and then uh, it's, it's becoming a different thing. But you have to experience that. If you're going to be in the university, you're going to be in that library all the time. What is it going to teach you? You're not going to feel what that racism that is out there. And I think that that racism is something that keeps us going. But it's something that we have to fight for. You know, my grandfather always told me, for all you have to have amor propio. If you lose your self-respect, you lose everything. And people have to be proud of who they are. My mother, all, you know, uh, I always made me proud of who I was. And one of the things that, you know, I look at today, you know, that my parents are dead. And I told the students today in, in, uh, uh, in the lecture in the class, 
Every day I get up, I look around, I said, you know what? Mama, Daddy, who are dead right now, thank me for having made me a Mexican because it's good to, to be different. It's good to be a Sal Salvadoran. It's good to be a Guatemalteco. It's good to be something different. Now, we have a movement here. And we have to reflect about the movement because everything in the past is not good. Because I do think that sometimes we do become very ethnocentric. I think that we exclude other people when there are other people who have the same struggle. I had to go through, about six years ago, I had to go through a kind of a, uh, an examination of consciousness. Uh, some of my gay students at the school came to me and they told me, he said, he says, Rudy, you always treat us nicely, he says, but you don't say anything and you have an awful lot of power. And then I looked at these kids who were 18, 19 years old. And I said to myself, if one of my sons or my daughter were gay, would I love him any less? You see? And I had to think about it. And so I say that how can I be an influential leader if I'm denying political space to someone else? And we have to build a movement. And that movement has to be a movement that has pure intention. We have to build a better society. But it's not going to be happening if we believe everything that is telling, you know, that they tell us in society, that they tell us in the books, and the importance of you having a Chicano studies here, and having a person like Mario Compian, and having the people here with the historical memories, because, you know, is that, you, that they will tell you that things are not good, that things could be better and that they were better at one time. Now, you know, uh, I have another book probably coming out in a year and a half to two years, and that's on uh, the historical memory, the role of historical memory in a strike that happened in 1933. Because I do believe that, you know, what the common person does is not unimportant. I am right here, I am writing books because of students and community people and because other people have sacrificed to put me where I am. I have the luxury of going to jail because I can get away with it and still get a paycheck. But how about a father who's working in the field who misses that paycheck and somebody doesn't eat because they don't get that paycheck? And I think we really have to start to look appreciate our parents, appreciate what went on before, because only in this way can we go forward. Thank you very much. Is there, any, power. Is there anything you want to say to Chicano Liberation? To, to Chicano Liberation Television? Uh, Chicano Liberation Television? Yeah, that's a new television show. Viva la raza. All right. Hey, is there something you want to say to Chicano Liberation Television? Que no se haga pendejos! Be proud of your race, and don't let nobody tell you different. You are who you are, and we're proud of you. All right. What about you? Get involved. Get involved. Get involved. Hey, excuse me. Is there something you want to say to Chicano Liberation Television? Come on. I'm not with him. We love Chicano Liberation. You know what? How you are? We love Chicano Liberation Television. All right. All I gotta say is, oh, yeah. Is there something you'd like to say to Chicano Liberation Television? To the young viewers out there, uncensored, keep it up.
by family or by my individual. There is an awful lot of things. Messages are, are hard to, are difficult to, 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 uh, uh, to register the vote. You do it by individual, yeah, but if you do it by family, it becomes what? Easy. The way you have to look at things is this. The problem is that we're getting an awful lot of uh, PhDs who are of Mexican American extraction who uh, go to school, who came to a PhD and have no what? Experiential knowledge. Experiential knowledge is good. Get involved. And you know what? As I said to the other class, every time I get up every morning, I thank my parents for making me Mexican. Because that's the thing the PhD did. Thank you very much. The smell of tortillas calling my name, warming my proud heart. And I'd pack un liacho de tortillas calentitas right at the comal, embarradas con mantequilla, the real thing for my friends. And I felt proud, mommy, because your tortillas with your secret ingredient made me feel canela warm inside, made me feel so special. Now in college, I miss your tortillas, mommy. Harina masada lovingly spanked and put to sleep, then rolled out just for us, made with your secret ingredient, turned over calientito con mucho amor. Oh. A couple of years back, we lost uh, one of the foremost figures in our Chicano movement, Cesar Chavez. And uh, um, Ricardo Sanchez uh, had invited me to uh, speak at uh, a memorial for Cesar Chavez. And uh, I think this has been the quickest poem I've ever written because I didn't have a poem ready for, for him. And then I wrote this in Pullman. It's called Memorias de Cesar Chavez. Memorias Calentitas, cold Seattle winter 1970. Voces Unidas, black eagle proudly flying, waving high so high like our dreams. Bronzes, bodies pounding the pavement, voces gritando, gritando, justicia, César animando, hombre de barro como esta tierra que nos nutre, hombre de corazón tan grande como la causa de tu gente, hombre querido, sufrido, regalando su corazón al pueblo. Aquí en Seattle, con tu gente caminando, Gritando, animando, brown memories keep ringing loudly, proudly today in Pullman 1993. The voices keep singing in union, unison, justicia para nuestra gente. Tu dedicación, tu memoria, keep flying high like an eagle. Y tu espíritu, espíritu de bronce permanece calentito en cada noble corazón. Um, <clears throat> last year, uh, I was, or two years ago, I was teaching um, eighth grade grammar in Granger, where we have a tremendous number of, of um, Mexican, Chicanos, Hispanics, whatever they want to call themselves, about 60, 70, 80 percent. And one girl got out to sharpen her pencil, and then she said, out of the blue, she said, isn't it cool how we can roll our R's? And I just stood there because I knew that there was a poem right there. So I went home, 
and I wrote this one for her. It's called, Isn't It Cool How We Can Roll Our R's? Isn't it cool how we can roll our R's? Rrr. Mi lengua baila rancheritas reverberando sonidos sonores. In some people's tongues, perro or dog limps lipless. Pero para mí, perro richly rolls relampagueando, rumbando in my canela trilling tripping tongue. My R's vibrate like a low rider mofle. Brum. It's so cool. I'm careening down life's highway, low riding, en mi carro lengua, con mi raza rete bonita, raza de nombres rítmicos, rumberos, Ramírez, Robles, Ruiz, Rodríguez, Ríos, ricos nombres retintiendo, diarreal, verduzco, carrasco, cárdenas, rete ricos regalos, reempujando mi carcacha lengua. Oh, my oh so cool cultura de everyday sorpresas, martes, miércoles, viernes. Ars rumbando con ritmo, resonando, columpiándose en mi lengua. Ricardo, Rita, Carmelo, Raquel, Rubén, Rodolfo, resbalando rete suavecito, Roberto, Rosa, Carlos, Rebeca, Rolando, rodando y rumbando, Ramón, Hermilinda, Rigo, Norma, Rey, recorriendo el run run ruidoso. Isn't it cool how we can roll our R's? My wife and my children and my surroundings, mi suegra, mis tías, uh, who cook tremendously, are my inspiration. And the kids, um, this one I wrote for my youngest. <laughs> On Father's Day, 1995, because he's a tremendous young man. And um, he has mowed my lawn for years. I don't have to mow the lawn anymore. And he's just a good, good son. And uh, I wrote this for him on Father's Day. It's called Father's Day Love. Father's Day comes but once a year. And on this special Sunday, around the world, millions of dads are honored. How lucky are those dads who snuggle cozy in their beds and sleepy-eyed hear cup and saucer clattering, closer rattling toward the bedroom? How fortunate are those dads who early in the morning hear tiptoeing children echoing, Happy Father's Day! How happy are those dads whose sons and daughters shower them with presents, hugs, and kisses? How fortunate are those dads who celebrate and revel in familial joy the long-drawn day? But I, my precious son, am blessed beyond my fondest dreams. You do all this, my son, and even more. For you, my son, bring joy to me the whole year long. You mow the lawn and whack the weeds for love and love alone. Before I go to work each day, I hug and kiss you and exit with a smiling heart. Again at night, before you go to sleep, you seek me out to get your nightly kiss. My days are worry-free. I know exactly where you are every minute of the day. Our trust and love for you is strong. You see, my precious son, you are a loving son. You honor me by serving God. <clears throat> Two more. A couple of years ago, we lost another friend. Uh, Rudy, I imagine that you uh, remember Ricardo Sanchez. I had the opportunity to meet him when I was in Pullman. And uh, when he arrived there, he was by himself, and, and his son were there, his wife was not there. And we invited him to come over for supper. And uh, my wife cooked up a storm for him. And uh, he left home 
but he uh, took some tortillas with him and he put them in his pocket. So I wrote this poem called Ricardo Sanchez with Tortillas in His Pocket. He migrated to the Washington Palouse, the land of golden wheat alone, sin ni un centavo en la bolsa. He migrated to Pomania, Wawa, Wazoo, that other university, solito, sin su esposa, su vida. He came to share with multicolored budding minds his universite, his humanite. Lo invitamos a cenar en Colfax, Washington. As an appetizer, we ate tortillas de harina calientitas embarradas con mantequilla. Luego comimos carnita con chile verde, arroz, ricolitos y más tortillas calientitas. Now scooping la carnita y el arroz, exchanging cinnamon smiles with the San Jacinto. Now making un taquito de frijoles, complimenting the cook. Comimos familia juntita, canela warm filling inside, savoring cafecito calientito, platicamos. He told me that he had heard about me those early movimiento years, and then silence, I disappeared. Me dijiste, Ricardo, el pueblo te necesita. It needs to hear your voice, flaco. Simón que sí, camarada. You excused yourself out of respect for my family, Salimos al porch so you could have a cigarette. You puffed small white circles in the cool summer night. Y seguimos con plática poética, animándome with each white ringlet rippling in the night air. With your boldness, boldness le taloneaste, opening doors for me, creating a stage for my poetry and to show Ricardo's university. En las mañanas, las semanas de la raza, me brindaste una introducción para mi libro In the Still of My Heart y de pilón me visitaste en Grandview. You shared your time-weathered canela heart con chavalos y chavalas de Granger High. Ricardo, your voice still echoes warmly, wafting, wavering softly in their hearts. Tu voz resonante suena y resuena tanto en este país como en México y en Europa. Saliste cansado, agotado, drained of life-giving love. You refueled en el restaurante El Ranchito de Zilla con refín mexicano. It hit the spot, pero ni le llegó a los talones a la comida de mi honey Leonor. Simón Ricardo, I remember you came to the Palouse in 1991, solito. Y nos visitaste esa noche de verano y te fuiste tu corazón contento y calientito, te fuiste, carnal, con tortillas de harina en your pocket. Uh, one last one. Um, some of you older people <laughs> probably remember when our parents or maybe grandparents used to uh, say the little refrán, A, E, I, O, U, el burro sabe más que tú. Sí? Okay. Uh, this one I wrote must have been 1975. This one was on the way from the newly constructed highway, the Ellensburg uh, uh, um, Yakima. And to combat this negative feeling, I wrote the poem called A, E, I, O, U. Dice, A, E, I, O, U, cinco vocales que debes aprender. A, E, I, O, U, no son iguales, lo debes comprender. A, son las tortillas de tu mamá. E, son las tortillas con café. I, son los frijoles para mí. O, son los taquitos que como yo. U, es la comida que comes tú. A, E, I, O, U, inteligente como tú. Muchas gracias. Gracias, Jesús. Un solo problema con la poesía. Ya me rompió el hambre. Sí, lo cené. La siguiente parte del programa, este, bueno, primeramente el, el, el grupo de los bailadores, como ya vimos, no está aquí por razones que no podemos explicar, solo que este, 
esta parte del programa ya, ya terminó la, la, la parte cultural. Enseguida vamos a, a pasar a los discursos programados para el resto del programa. Y la, la última parte del programa va a ser donde vamos a reconocer a las personas que han contribuido a la, los esfuerzos, a las metas del movimiento chicano con su trabajo y con sus sacrificios personales. Enseguida quiero presentar a, a una persona que es muy bien conocida aquí en el Valle de Yakima y por todo el estado de Washington en otras partes del país. La, el título del programa dice, de, de, de la, la celebración de esta noche es Lucha contra la discriminación, 30 años del movimiento chicano. Ese título presenta el concepto de lucha y estas personas que van a presentar sus su discursos esta noche tienen algo en común, que han luchado por sus esfuerzos y sacrificios personales. Pero para que nos den un repaso del movimiento chicano y, y sus experiencias personales aquí en el estado de Washington, vamos a recibir con un gran aplauso a una persona que es que su récord lo explica por sí mismo, señor Ricardo García. ¿Cuánta Jesús Maldonado? Y yo conocí a Jesús Maldonado en los mediados de los sesentas. I met up with Jesus uh, sometime in the mid-60s, and uh, I was as flaco como él en aquel tiempo. Y se pasan los años y Jesús todavía sigue flaco. <laughs> y el cabello de él se le puso blanco y yo perdí el cabello. Es importante saber eso porque todos ustedes, la mayoría que son jóvenes, el tiempo se nos pasa muy pronto y cuando menos piensen, You will be up here uh, in some way or, or another sharing stories or, or sharing your experiences. I, I was at a meeting today uh, which has to do with, with Hanford, and a report that we received was that between 1952 and 1957, five years, there were 100 atomic bombs tested in Nevada, Nevada, which is next to Mexico. 150 million curries of radiation went into, into, into the air. And the report says that everyone, everyone in the United States, in one way or another was contaminated by those uh, radi radiation curries. You know, wh when you mentioned Ricardo Sanchez, Ricardo Sanchez died a very young man, and he died of cancer. A and you can't help quickly, se me va la mente que Quizás él murió, y muchos que nosotros hemos conocido que han muerto de cáncer. Perhaps they died because they were exposed to that radiation. And, and the lesson here is that the young people, we, we have to, you have to be very, very involved nowadays so that you can prevent this type of catastrophes from happening. I will not speak very long tonight. Uh, the Chicano movement in the state of Washington is a beautiful story. It's a very long story. It's a story filled with laughter, with tears, with friendship, with love. And uh, we had poets, you know, Jesus Maldonado has been reciting poetry ever since 1968, 67 when I met him. Lalo Delgado, uh, although he's from Colorado, he was another poet, always that poetry to inspire you. There was a lot of music, there was a lot of songs, there was a lot of gathering of young, when we were younger, coming together and singing. And that's something perhaps the young people have to bring back. The, the joy of singing because it's part of our herencia. And if there's something that happened in the state of Washington through the Chicano movement, making the story very short, is that uh, many of us became involved at an early age, like many of you are doing it now. I went to YVCC in 1966. In 1966, there were only four Chicanos, Tomás Villanueva, Tino Gamboa, Erasmo Gamboa, and myself. A few years later, when, when, when we started to demand more 
scholarships and, and equality in education. At the University of Washington in, in the early 70s, uh, late 68, 69, there were only three at the University of Washington. So, so you can see that uh, over the years, in a span of 35 years, maybe 34, 33 years, uh, look at what, ha what has happened at YBC. You have a, a student body of 3,000, but you also have more than one-third Rasa there. And at WSU, although David might not see them, uh, there are more Rasa at WSU and also at Central Flaco. Uh, and all of this comes about because over the years, you know, it started with the Chicano movement, demanding, pressuring, asking for, for your uh, rightful place in, in these institutions. Many of us got involved very, very, very young. We learned a lot. Some opportunities showed up, educational opportunities. We learn about boards. We, lo we learn about community-based organizations. And if there's something that we accomplished in the 60s and the 70s was we created Farm Workers Health Clinic. We created the Washington State Migrant Council. We created the Yakima Valley OIC. We created People for People. We created EPIC. We created the Yakima Office of Farm Worker Housing we created La Clinica in Pasco. All of these organizations are still with us and they provide very, very good services. And the only question that, that you have to raise tonight is how come many of those leaderships, porque todos son Chicanos, except OIC, uh, Henry Beauchamp, except Epic, uh, Ferguson, except People for People, uh, Gary, something. The others are all Chicanos, Guillermo Castañeda, Carlos Diaz, Carlos Olivares, and so on. La pregunta es, del movimiento Chicano, how come they're not here tonight? You know, those organizations owe their existence to the Chicano movement. There, there are answers. I, I don't want to be very critical of my friends because they are my friends. But we always have to raise that question, how come? And, and therefore, the challenge perhaps tonight to the young people is to go and ask, why, why aren't you there? Or the idea that you want to come back and take over those organizations because those organizations will need leadership in the, in the very, very near future. Just like the schools and the hospitals and the banks and the businesses will need your presence, so do these organizations, community-based organizations. The challenge today is very different from the challenge that Cornejo and Jesus and Luz and Acuna went through in, in the early 60s and the 70s. The, the challenge today now that all of these things have been accomplished, there's equality, of, you know, there's more opportunities to go to school, there's more opportunities to get into business, there's more opportunities to, to, to get into some very good uh, professions. You, you need to come back as young people and really help us, as, as long as we're here and Luz is here, in this idea of the empowerment, the political empowerment of the community. Luz has been working hard, and Tony Sandoval, and Hector Franco, uh, and others, Roberto Cornejo, to register people. And there's a good number of people now in our valley, nuevos ciudadanos que pueden votar, están registrados, pero necesitamos que cultivarlos ahora. Y necesitamos la ayuda de ustedes, who are, really, the, the, the second wave of the Chicano movement, because you're, you're here and you're accepting the challenge of Chicanismo. Mecha, Mecha es parte del movimiento Chicano. So come back, Flaco, and come back, Ce Cecilia and David, y Neto, Ernesto, and, and, and the others that are here tonight. Come back and help us. There's very good opportunities. You know, you will not be poor. You will, you will make good money, but at the same time, you will also be helping uh, finish something that we started in the 60s. Gracias. Ricardo es un, es como decir en inglés, walking history book. La otra vez estaba aquí, ahora tenemos que entrevistar para para grabar ¿no? esas, esas experiencias como researchers, ¿no? grabar para archivar para las otras generaciones que vienen después. Enseguida, siguiendo, el, el, la, la, siguiendo la onda, el, el, 
el tema de recordar las luchas. Tenemos una persona que es muy bien conocido por toda la nación como una persona que se ha destacado en el movimiento chicano, uno de los primeros que definió la dirección del movimiento, la, la perspectiva del movimiento, principalmente primero porque fue la primera persona que publicó uno de los libros que se le puede categorizar con la perspectiva del movimiento chicano. Ese libro ha influido más que nada a todo el desarrollo de la, del campo de los estudios chicanos, en, las, en los colegios, en las universidades. Pero también esta persona es mucho, muy respetado, no solamente por sus contribuciones en el campo académico, sino porque siempre ha estado al pie de la lucha en las comunidades, donde quiera que le han llamado, siempre va, siempre responde. Y esta vez lo invitamos para que viniera aquí a animar a la gente, pero también para que viniera a educar a otras personas. Por ejemplo, hoy presentó dos pláticas en el colegio y lo más, quizás, lo que más me sorprendió de eso es que la presidenta del colegio quedó ahí desde el principio hasta que terminó. Muy hecho, muy atenta. Esperamos que la educó. Ojalá que haya cambiado de perspectiva un poquito para que acepte más las, lo que están diciendo los, los jóvenes hoy en día, especialmente en el colegio. Solo que con eso quiero presentarles al, al señor, al profesor, al doctor Rodolfo Acuña de la ciudad de Los Ángeles. Es profesor en la Universidad de California en Northridge, fundador del departamento, del primer departamento de estudios chicanos en los colegios. Y desde entonces no ha dejado de trabajar. Profesor, doctor, amigo, Rodolfo Acuña. On, on the time. But I'd like to say that, you know, I, and I, some of you are going to hear some repetition from today's presentation, from yesterday's presentation. But, you know, I remember when I got my doctorate, I felt very important because I had a doctorate in front of the name. Until I went home and I, and I told my father, and my, you know, that I had a doctorate. And my father says, si eres doctor, que curas? And, uh, you know, I've always thought about that because I really think about things and think about words. And I tease an awful lot, but I really do think about the words. And the things that I do many times seem a little bit idiosyncratic, but they have a purpose. Like, you know, I, I wear the gafas all the time. They say, well, well, where's the sun? Well, in a way, I wear it to bug people. Uh, you know, uh, if you've ever been with Anglo-Americans, they always want to look at you in the eyes. They want to look at you straight in the eyes. You know, if you don't look at straight in the eyes, you know, something's wrong. So I like to sit there with my glasses, and I learned a long time ago going to meetings that used to bug people. Well, now I find it bugging Chicanos. And what it's telling me is that Chicanos, as Chicanos, we're becoming a little bit like them because we're letting something like that bug us, you see, and we should allow them to bug us. And then some of the, the things come back. And I was on uh, the radio program today, and I'm sorry, you know, I, my, my parents come from, or my mother's family comes from Sonora, and I was raised with a family from Sonora, and everybody uses bad words. <laughs> it becomes almost natural to use bad words. You know, uh, the other day, the, in Santa Barbara, they, they renamed a street, and they were going to name it Cesar Chavez Way. And I said, gee, no, you can't name it Cesar Chavez Way. You're going to have, you know, uh, Calle Cesar Chavez, something like that, but not Cesar Chavez Way, because you know how our people are, you know. Well, today, I use the word pendejo in, in, in uh, the radio station. Somebody called up very angry. But, you know, I use it not in, in the term. In my new book, 
uh, anything but Mexican. I use the word that you, uh, there, the pendejo factor. And I say that, you know, that many times we act pendejos, or nos, nos hacemos pendejos, because we don't want to act. We don't want to do something. And sometimes we don't want to do something because if we know the truth, then we have to do something about it. It's, it's like, uh, did you ever see the, the movie, con, uh, Cantiflas, estaba, you know, he was up there in el cielo, and he was telling the, uh, the uh, joke of, the, of uh, el pícaro to, to the, uh, to the uh, angels up there, and St. Peter comes there and he kicks him out of heaven, you know. And so he goes down there, and the first person he sees, el diablo con sus cuernos, he says, tú también eres casado. You know, and, and, and you know, the thing is that many times society puts cuernos on us and we do nothing about it. And it's not using it because, you know, if we know that something is wrong, then we have to do something about it. This is why in the last um, six years, the last six years I almost died because I took on the University of California system. And they spent between four and a half million dollars to five million dollars fighting me. And, uh, you know, they built an awful lot of myths and it was something that was a grind almost every day. And I am now just starting to recuperate. Uh, I get tired because of it, because it was a constant, you know, uh, a hassle there. But I wanted to prove one thing. Number one, that we can win. Because if a person like me that has white hair can win, you can win, you see. And we can't, we, we can't take what society does to us because society is not just, and this is not the most just country in the world. And people can't tell me, go back where you came from because my people were in uh, Arizona in 1729. They were, you know, there from Sonora. So where am I gonna go back? One of the reporters today asked me, well, if, he says, if you don't like this country, you have been, why don't you go back to, uh, you know, where you came from? I didn't come from Mexico, I came from here. But you know, you look at my books too, when I call it Occupied America, I'm not talking about just Mexico, because Mexico is a social construct of, uh, of uh, colonialism. I'm talking about Central America, I'm talking about all of the Americas, you see. And we're going to have to start to look at that thing of racism and what really makes up racism. And we start to see that, you know, there's, there are different kinds of racism. The, the, the racism uh, towards black Americans, which is a racism which is insidious and we should hate that kind of racism. But, you know, that still, there's a certain, because of the historical nature of it, there's a certain guilt today in our society. They did something wrong. They did something wrong when they killed off the Native Americans. Never putting it together because you have an invisible border and you say, here, you see, indigenous people over that you know, border, we had nothing to do with it. And the people are really coming across, those are the people that are the problem because they don't even belong here. And you go to Texas, for example, and, you, and the whole thing of history, that they fought a war against Mexico and they beat Mexico in a, what they call a just war. And it's what they say, you know, I remember in Texas, you know, when I first got to Texas, I found it fascinating because uh, people in their own minds, many people were, uh, were intimidated. I remember one time I was in, in a place called Tohoka, Texas, and I just sat there in amazement that, that the Chicanos allowed themselves to be called boy or junior, and they wouldn't say anything about it. But this was, you know, from my perspective, but I had the perspective, another perspective, another experience, which was a California experience, you see. As bad as things were, that people didn't openly tell you those things. But you know, today, students, and you know, one of the callers today, that they didn't experience racism. This is what they were saying. Well, racism today is a racism that we really can't understand, you see. And you're going to have to, 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 to understand that racism of today, which is not the racism at one time where they would call you a greaser or where 
uh, they would t tell you you couldn't buy in a certain place or you couldn't go to a swimming pool. This was obvious. You could do, you could work with that kind of racism. I remember the first time I went to Lubbock, I went to a reception, and here I was with a guy by the name of Mark Smith, a good lawyer. But one of his guests tells me, he says, you know, did you ever hear about the machine? I said, what machine? Hitler's machine. And I said, oh, God, here it comes. And, it, and then he started telling me about a machine that, he, that Himmler took to Hitler, and they brought in 10 Jews, and shh, it eliminated the 10 Jews, and then they brought another 10 Jews, shh, and about the 10th time that they used the machine, he says, they brought in a Mexican. And shh. And, and Hitler says, why, why did you use a Mexican? Because he had Hitler talking with a, with a Texas accent, you know. And I, he said, uh, uh, he says, well, we had to grease the machine, didn't we? I sat there and I said, well, I looked at the guy and I said, should I hit the guy? I know I can't hit the guy. The guy's too big, you know. Uh, and then I'm going to end up in jail, you know, for, for hitting him. Then I told him, I says, well, you know, they have a saying in Latin America, you pour hot water over a white Anglo-Saxon uh, Texan and you get instant caca. You see, and, and, and I put that in the first edition of Occupied America, you see. And the thing is, the guy wanted to hit me, you see, because I had insulted him. But, you know, that racism, and, you know, and I've never been racist against any group. You see, uh, uh, I always remember the story that Bert Corona, who was an activist in California and almost all over the United States, used to tell about Ed Cabedo. Ed Cabedo used to be a, an activist. And he was a bombastic person. He was telling about the war, the Mexican-American War, and he was telling about uh, Carney's Army of the West coming into Santa Fe and the atrocities they, they committed. And there was a little Bato Loco, a little Bato Loco, I don't know if you have him up here, little street dudes, you know, a uh, little Cholillo, you know, he's back there, and he's listening. And he didn't know if, 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 if he was listening, because he was giving that, you know, Ike look, you know, and, you know, and uh, you, you couldn't penetrate it. But after the speech, he got up, he went out into the streets, and the first bolillo he saw, I don't know if they still use the word bolillo, but is a what? Is a piece of bread. But we used to use it to refer to what? To, to gringos. And the first bolillo he saw, he let him have it. Bam! And the guy fell to the ground. He says, what was that for? He says, that was for 1847. He says, he says yeah, but that happened over 100 years ago. He says, yeah, but I just found out about it right now. <laughs> you see, it, 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 and nobody's talking about history, it, you know, to get even or anything, but you have to know about history. I uh, know, I said, no, what? Pendejos. Because if we, you know, if we allow then the lie, the myth to become what? The reality, then everything is all right. But what is the present? Because, you know, I come from Los Angeles, and Los Angeles is a place that is very polarized today. It, the, the racism is never as hard as, uh, you know, as 30 years ago. California was, was actually one of the best places to live 30 years ago for a Mexican because there was some mobility. There was uh, a, a certain amount of integration that was taking place that wasn't taking place in, let's say, places like Texas. I go back to Texas today, and I don't see the, the hardening attitudes that I, that I feel in California. And why? It's a matter of numbers, you see. In California today, 30%, one out of three, almost one out of three of the residents in California are Latinos. That is an awful lot, one out of three. You see, in the Los Angeles City Schools, two out of three students are Latinos there. That's two out of three, and that's a big percentage, and it's growing, because we're having babies. Did anybody ever see that, uh, that picture, uh, Cousin Vinny, where she says, you know, you can hear the, uh, the biological clock, you know? Uh, the median age of what? White woman is 35. The median age of Latinas is 24. And so you see that, that you know, right now they can close the border, but the but those babies are going to keep rolling out, you see, because they're going to, they're having an awful lot of children. Well, this is changing things. This is changing the whole philosophy of society because all of our immigration policy up until 1965 was based on national origins. The 1921 Act and the 1924 Quota Acts 
that were passed in immigration were passed under national origins. And what actual national origins meant is that it had a fixed percentage to keep the percentage of Northern Europeans higher than the percentage of, uh, of Southern Europeans because they didn't want as many Italians and many uh, Greeks coming in as they did uh, Nordic people. When we see these revisions and we see uh, uh, the acts revised, this is always at the forefront. Keep national origins. Let's make sure that we have more Nordic people than we have Alpine people or we have Mediterranean people. We don't want too many people with very dark hair. We don't want too many brown-eyed people. We want a certain amount of blue-eyed people because those blue-eyed people are more intelligent. This has been a basic immigration policy of the United States. That policy in 1965 was reversed because under the 1960s we had another ambiance that was more uh, it was uh, a more liberal one. It put Latin Americans on a quota, but it was a very liberal quota because it was based on family preferences, you see. And people believed that people from Europe were going to continue to come in, although Europe was now recovering and you were making more money in Europe than you were making here in the United States. So European immigration did slow down. If you're a worker in Germany, you're much better off than if you're a worker in the United States. You have much more social benefits. All right. But what happened? They started to come in, not only from Mexico, but they started to come in from the Far East. You see, they started to come in from uh, India. They started to come in from the Middle East. These are people that look different. By the 1970s, people are starting to panic. We're going to have a nation now, and you see Los Angeles go from 10% Latino in 1960 to about 25% in 1970. This is starting to scare the hell out of people, you see. At the same time, the city is getting an awful lot more what? It's getting an awful lot more population. You don't have as much housing, etc. cetera. You, uh, people uh, are starting to rebel in paying taxes. You have a certain amount of de deterioration happening, and you start to blame. You find a scapegoat. Who's the scapegoat going to be? The immigrant. And they start a campaign. And that campaign uh, is one of constructing an image of the immigrant. That of what? What I've t uh, told the classes today, that of the illegal alien. And you, that is, when you start to look at it, illegal alien. First of all, it tells you that Mexicans look like E.T., you see. That uh, Mexicans are going to look like E.T., they're going to uh, be like the body snatchers. They're going to come over and take over your body. And you see an awful lot of movies, uh, Independence Day, for example. These are the aliens, and there's a certain fear of the unknown, of the other. The other one is illegal, which is criminal. A person is a criminal if they cross a border trying to eat. And they construct this. The reality of the picture is, and as I've said uh, before, is you can go to California, you don't find Latinos begging. You find other people begging, and I'm not criticizing them because conditions are making them beg, but you don't find Latinos begging. You find people with a sign on a corner, and you find a Latino right next to him sell, selling cacahuates and selling oranges, you see. They don't but we're coming here for welfare, you see. And that's the image that people have. You look at all of the figures. We have more labor, uh, labor participation than Anglo-Americans. We're 81% that are active in the labor force. There are 79%. The problem is we're not getting paid enough. We don't have, uh, we don't have medical insurance, for example. But this construction, this racist construction that paints a picture of a, of a whole people and generalizes that. You see it uh, starting to be constructed in the 1970s. You even see it on television, where the word racism becomes an innocuous thing. And along with that, you have your think tanks. The right wing starts to uh, mobilize. And you have then people like 
Richard Mellon Scaife. Richard Mellon Scaife, in the last 30 years, has given 200, excuse me, $233 million to right-wing uh, causes. They've taken over the universities. You have the Owen Foundation, the Pioneer Foundation, the Heritage Foundation, the Smith Richardson Foundation, and all of these decrepit uh, old uh, white people who are going to die want to keep their concept of America, and they, uh, and they donate these billions of dollars to right-wing causes, and you, then they start to, to construct this racist uh, agenda. This racist agenda that, is, uh, that produces the bell curve, the book, The Bell Curve. And this person here, the two people were on subsidies, you see. The, that whole fracas over politically correct. You have them finance the English only. You have them financing 187, 209. And right now, the attack on California against bilingual education. Now, these things are not things that are happening by accident. We're in a war. And Pat Buchanan is right. There, it is a culture war that's going on. But like, excuse me, but like pendejos, we, we, we wander around and we're not organizing. We're not doing anything about it. In the last five years, I've also realized that maybe I shouldn't be as active as I have been in certain other sectors, and I should start to focus. I've been doing an awful lot more writing for example. And one of uh, the books uh, that I just put out it was Anything But Mexican. You look at the title, Anything But Mexican, people will say, gee, that's a bad title. But it isn't Anything But Mexican. You go to Los Angeles and when you see Mexican food over there, uh, at a, the oldest restaurant in LA is El Cholo. Make great green tamales. You know, con rajas ahí, con, uh, con uh, queso. I mean, they're really good. Al estilo sonorense. Couldn't be anything but good. But the thing is that you have over there and you have a sign, Spanish food. Because it makes it more palatable because it's Spanish, you see. And, and you see just the attitude that people have, the tensions that we have in the city, and you have not, nobody talking about what? Latino issues. It's almost like we didn't exist. And even when you go on Spanish language television and you see the Barbie dolls up there, you see, they don't, they don't look like the populace. But this is a form of racism, it's a very insidious type of racism. Uh, I wish I had a dollar for every time that they've told me you don't look Mexican, you see. You see. And I, you know, I, again, being very uh, irreverent, I tell them you haven't seen my nalgas, you know. And you know, you, you know the thing is that, you, you know, I, I, but the thing is that sometimes you have to get irreverent with people. And, but you know, when they say you don't look like Mexican, it's like, you, what? It's a compliment. It's like a, it's a compliment. Or Mexicans who themselves to tell you, what? I had a French grandmother. Les faltan las plumas, but they have a French grandmother. And that's anything but Mexican. Is, it's a play on words, but it, it is a strategy because I want to control history. Because I know that future historians are going to be writing about what happened today, and they're going to be basing it on works that are happening today. And my reality is Los Angeles, and I think that Los Angeles is like that Blade Runner movie. It is a what? It is a view. It's a window into the what? Into the future for you. And so you look at that. Now I'm coming out with another book. It's going to be, it's already completed. It's going to be published. In, uh, in January by University of Notre Dame Press. It's called Sometimes There's No Other Side. It's essays on truth and objectivity. And I show how the neoliberal philosophy controls academia and controls the courts, you see. This is a nation of laws. And just because a bunch of pendejos go out and pass a 187, they expect us to what? To follow the law. Because it's, you know, that's the will of the majority. They don't talk about fairness, they don't talk about justice, they don't talk about the future, but they talk about what? This is a, that, that we're supposed to follow the law. This uh, book uh, this uh, book also talks about my case against the University of, uh, of California. But I hit the system, and I hit the system, and I hit also Chicanos. 
because I'm getting tired of Chicano academics who are saying that the 60s had no value and they were going to take us to another level of consciousness. Some of them have never been active in a thing. They've gone from K through PhD and they have no experiential, ex, uh, experiential uh, you, you know, experience, you see. And I think that you have to have experience. Experience is good. I uh, look at every time I go to jail, which I've been there now seven times, and I feel very good because I'm learning something, you see. And I'm learning from someone. Put it down on my vita. But the thing is that, you know, that, that uh, we have to look at things like that. You have to le learn uh, uh, to look at people, to see the differences in people. So you have to feel like when you go down the Pilsen district in Chicago and you see how the Mexicans have remade that, that architecture. You have to go, you know, the, one of the greatest experiences for me is when I went to Washington on that march on Washington because it was the first time I went to a Latino march where Chicanos were in the minority. But I saw, you know, the Dominicans coming in there and they dancing, you know, for, for five miles. They danced all the way, you know. They, they kept on calling me mommy, you know, and I, they had, <laughs> you know, but, but it is a different world. Right now, Los Angeles is an exciting place because, I mean, you know, you have to become a salsero to be there. You know, I went to, to a, salsa, a salsa concert the other day and I saw Willy Colon, La Fela del Bronx, you see, and then uh, it's, it's becoming a different thing. But you have to experience that. If you're going to be in the university, you're going to be in that library all the time, what is it going to teach you? And you're not going to feel what that racism that is out there. And I think that that racism is something that keeps us going. But it's something that we have to fight for. You know, my grandfather always told me, por algo tienes que tener amor propio. If you lose your self-respect, you lose everything. And people have to be proud of who they are. My mother, oh, you know, uh, I always made me proud of who I was. And one of the things that, you know, I look at today, you know, that my parents are dead. And I told the students today in, in, uh, uh, in, in the lecture in the class, every day I get up, I look around, I said, you know what, mama, daddy, you are dead right now. Thank me for having made me a Mexican because it's good to, to be different. It's good to be a Sal Salvadoran. It's good to be a Guatemalteco. It's good to be something different. Now, we have a movement here. And we have to reflect about the movement because everything in the past is not good. Because I do think that sometimes we do become very ethnocentric. I think that we exclude other people when there are other people who have the same struggle. I had to go through, about six years ago, I had to go through a kind of a, uh, an examination of consciousness. Uh, some of my gay students at the school came to me and they told me, he said, he says, Rudy, you always treat us nicely, he says, but you don't say anything and you have an awful lot of power. And then I looked at these kids who were 18, 19 years old, and I, and I said to myself, if one of my sons or my daughter were gay, would I love them any less? You see? And I had to think about it. And so I say that how can I be an influential leader if I'm denying political space to someone else? And we have to build a movement. And that movement has to be a movement that has pure intention. We have to build a better society. But it's not going to be happening if we believe everything that is telling, you know, that they tell us in society, that they tell us in the books, and the importance of you having a Chicano studies here and having a person like Mario Compian and having the people here with the historical memories, because, you know, is that that they will tell you that things are not good, that things could be better, and that they were better at one time. Now, you know, uh, I have another book probably coming out in a year and a half to two years, and it's on uh, the historical memory, the role of historical memory in a strike that happened in 1933. Because I do believe that, you know, what the common person does is not unimportant. I am right here. I am writing books because of students and community people and because other people have sacrificed 
to put me where I am. I have the luxury of going to jail because I can get away with it and still get a paycheck. But how about a father who's working in the fields who misses that paycheck and somebody doesn't eat because they don't get that paycheck? And I think we really have to start to look, appreciate our parents, appreciate what went on before, because only in this way can we go forward. Thank you very much. I said Rudy for his inspiring work. I laid up my self-set rule for tonight. I was not speaking any English at all. But, but I, I decided I should demonstrate that I, that I am bilingual after all. La siguiente parte del programa, we're going to turn it over to the machistas. I am going to turn it over to the machistas. Uh, there are several people that worked very hard to, to start this effort and, and worked in a committee. Uh, there were no chairpersons on this committee. Everybody worked like the devil to pull it off. And uh, at this point, we're going to turn it over to them for the next part of the program. The only thing I want to say about the next part of the program uh, is that we're, we're, uh, we discussed it as, as uh, not only a fundraising event, not only to remember the, mo the movement, but also to recognize people, individuals, who have contributed to that, that sense of trouble to, to their personal, through their personal sacrifice. And earlier today, I, 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 as we were going around, um, uh, uh, Professor Acuna making the rounds of his uh, engagements, I listened to somebody make a comment that said, uh, what is wrong today with the machistas is that they're not out in the community. They're not having the impact that they should have. And I'm sitting there listening to that man say that, make that statement, and, and that's not the same reality that, that I've been seeing the last six months that I've been here, since I got here to, to Washington State. It is true that there are times when there's a peak of activity and there's a time when activity is low, and, and you know, that, that's the history of, of all activity. What is not true is that machistas have not been in the community. They have. Some more than others, yes. But the reality is that they have been in the community working and have a sense. And it's that sense of community, that sense of struggle in the community that is trying to be captured with the awards that we have tonight. That is, they're called Machista for Life Award. That is, the persons who receive it will be given the title of Honorary Machistas for Life because their record is in the highest tradition, the ideal uh, a tradition of a machista community service, and that is a concept that we're, we're trying to promote with this, these awards tonight, is re recognizing this individual. To do the first part of this, of this program, and we have uh, Sarah Carrion. These NASA awards are, beginning, are going to be given to them for different things that they've done in, in the Washington State. And this next award, this first award is going to be given to Hipolito Mendez, known as Paul. And this is um, given to him for a youth service award. Um, we went out in the community and we asked a lot of, um, we got a lot of nominees from the community and we asked a lot of youth which ones maybe affected his li um, their lives more. And um, this first, I guess a lot of students said that they, that Mr. Paul Mendez has really affected their life by helping them graduate, and by letting them have a goal in life. I'm his bio, I'm going to part of this award. He will be on this round of eight, and I'm going to be on this piece of that. He will be on this with an entire student at Colorado State University. And he's in the United States, and he's in the United States. And he's in the United States, and he's in the United States, and he's in the United States. That was one of 
one of the many organizations of El Movimiento Chicano Chicana. He is a native of, the, of Washington State. Since his return to the Yakima Valley, Paul has been quietly but consistently active working, with young, working to help young people.
president of Polish Library. There are others that contributed, as, as, as you see on the camera, there, I mean, Randy, uh, and there's now the first black boy from the library club, and so follow. So I follow you, gracias, keep up the hard work. Ernesto, you know, is now, it's, it's a, he's an alien now, he's in Washington State. It's a, it's a, Esto concluye el programa de esta noche y una vez más quiero que salga las gracias a todos por haber apoyado a este esfuerzo y esperen uh, en el futuro, muy pronto en el futuro, una, más pedidos de support porque el esfuerzo va a continuar. Hoy fue un comienzo pequeño, pero Estamos seguros de que va a crecer el esfuerzo y sin el apoyo de ustedes naturalmente que no nos creen, sin el esfuerzo que pues, va a fracasar, no podemos permitir que fracase este esfuerzo porque está, es algo que están haciendo en nuestra comunidad, no viene del gobierno, no viene de los políticos, este esfuerzo viene, están haciendo del mismo pueblo. Muchísimas gracias y que viva la verdad.